The White Mall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Rowdy Delaney, Idaho, USA. The White Mall by Frank L. Packard. Chapter 12 Crooks versus Crooks. It was not far. Schlucker, hastening along, still muttering to himself, turned into a cross street some two blocks away, and from there again into a lane, and a moment later led the way through a small door in the fence that hung battered and half open on sagging broken hinges. Rhoda Gray's eyes traveled sharply around her in all directions. It was still light enough to see fairly well, and she might at some future time find the bearings she took now to be of inestimable worth. Not that there was much to remark. They crossed a diminutive and disgustingly dirty backyard, whose sole reason for existence seemed to be that of a receptacle of four old tin cans, and were confronted by the rear of what appeared to be a four-story tenement. There was a back door here, and on the right of the door, fronting the yard, a single window that was some four or five feet from the level of the ground. Schlucker, without hesitation, opened the back door shut it behind them, led the way along the black, unlighted hall, and halting before a door well toward the front of the building, knocked softly upon it, giving two raps, a single rap, and then two more in quick succession. There was no answer. He knocked again in precisely the same manner, and then footsteps sounded from within, and the door flung open. "'Fools!' growled Schlucker in greeting, as they stepped inside and the door was closed again. "'A pair of brainless fools!' There were two men there. They paid Schlucker scant attention. They both grinned at Rhoda Gray through the murky light supplied by a wheezy and wholly inadequate gas jet. "'Hello, Nan,' jibed the smaller of the two. "'Who let you out?' "'Ah, forget it,' croaked Rhoda Gray. Schlucker took up the cudgels. "'Close your face, Pinky,' he snapped. "'Get down to cases. Do you think I got nothing to do but chase you two around like a couple of puppy dogs that haven't got sense enough to take care of themselves? Wasn't what I told you over the phone enough without me having to come here? Nix on that stuff, returned the one designated as Pinky imperturbably. Say, you'll be glad you came when we let you in on a little piece of easy money. We ain't asking your advice. All we're asking you to do is frame up the alibi, same as usual, for me and the pug here in case we wants it. Schlucker shook his fist. "'Frame nothing,' he sputtered angrily. "'Ain't I telling you that orders are not to make a move, that everything is off for a few days? That's the word I got a little while ago, and the 739 is going out now. Nan'll tell you the same thing.' "'Sure,' corroborated Rhoda Gray, picking up the obvious cue. "'That's to straight goods.' The two men were lounging beside a table that stood at the extreme end of the room, and now for a moment they whispered together. And as they whispered, Rhoda Gray found her first opportunity to take critical stock of both her surroundings and the two men themselves. Pinky, a short, slight little man, she dismissed with hardly a glance. He was the common type, with low, vicious cunning stamped all over his face, an ordinary rat of the underworld. But her glance rested longer on his companion. The pug was indeed entitled to his moniker. His face made her think of one. It seemed to be all screwed up and out of shape. Perhaps the eye-patch over his right eye helped a little to put the finishing touch of repulsiveness upon a countenance already most unpleasant. The celluloid eye-patch, once flesh-colored, was now so dirty and smeared that its original color was discernible only in spots. The once white elastic cord that circled his head and kept the patch in place was in equal disrepute. A battered slouch hat came to the level of the eye patch in a forbidding sort of tilt. His left eyelid drooped until it was scarcely open at all and fluttered continually. One nostril of his nose was entirely closed and his mouth seemed to be twisted out of shape, so even in repose the lips never entirely met at one corner. And his ears, what she could see of them in the poor light, and on account of the slouched hat, seemed to bear out the low-type criminal impression the man gave her, and that they lay flat back against his head. She turned her eyes away with a little shudder of repulsion, and gave her attention to an inspection of the room. There was no window except a small one high up on the right-hand partition wall. 
she quite understood what that meant. It was common enough, and all too unsanitary enough, in these old and cheap tenements. The window gave not on the out-of-doors, but on a light well. For the rest, it was a room she had seen a thousand times before, carpetless, unfurnished save for the barest necessities, dirt everywhere, unkempt. Pinky Bond broke in abruptly upon her inspection. "'That's all right,' he announced airily. "'We'll let Nan in on it, too. The pug and me figures she can give us a hand.' Skulker's wizened little face seemed suddenly to go purple. "'Are you trying to make a fool of me?' he half screamed. "'Or can't you understand English? "'Do you want me to keep on telling you till I'm hoarse "'that there ain't nobody going in with you? "'Because you ain't going in yourself. "'See? Understand that? "'There's nothing doing tonight for anybody, and that means you.' "'Ah, shut up, Skulker!' It was the pug now, a curious whispering sibilancy in his voice do no doubt to the disfigurement of his lips. Give Pinky a chance to shoot a spiel before you injure yourself throwing a fit. Go on, Pinky, spill it. Sure, said Pinky eagerly. Listen, Schluck, it ain't any crib we're wantin' to crack, or nothing like that. It's just a couple of crooks that won't dare open up their yaps to the bulls, cause what we're after'll be what they'll have pinched themselves, see? Schlucker's face lost some of its belligerency, and in its place a dawning interest came. "'What's that?' he demanded cautiously. "'What crooks?' "'French Pete and Marny Day,' said Pinky, and grinned. "'Oh!' Schlucker's eyebrows went up. He looked at the pug, and the pug winked knowingly with his half-closed left eyelid. Schlucker reached for a chair, and finding it suspiciously wobbly, straddled it warily. "'Maybe I've been wrong,' he admitted. "'What's the lay?' "'Me,' said Pinky. "'I was down at Charlie's this afternoon, having a little lay-off, and—' "'One of these days,' interrupted Schlucker, sharply. "'You'll go out like—' he snapped his fingers. "'That! Can't you leave that stuff alone?' "'I got to have me a bit of coke,' Pinky answered, with a shrug of his shoulders. "'And anyway, I ain't no pipe-hitter.' "'It's all the same, whatever way you take it,' retorted Schlucker. "'Well, go on with your story.' You went down to Charlie's dope parlors and jabbed a needle into yourself, or took it some other old way. I get you. What happened then? It was about an hour ago, resumed Pinky Bond with undisturbed complacency. Just as I was beating it out of there by the cellar, I hear some whispering as I was passing one of the inn doors. Savvy? I hadn't made no noise, and they hadn't heard me. I gets a peek in, cause the door's cracked. It was French Pete and Marnie Day. I listens and after about two seconds I was going shaky for fear someone would come along, and I wouldn't get the whole of it. Take it from me, Schluck, it was some goods. Schlucker grunted noncommittally. Well, go on, he prompted. I didn't get all the fine points, grinned Pinky, but I got enough. There was a guy by the name of Daney, who used to live somewhere on the east side here, and used to work in some sweatshop, and he worked till he got pretty old, and then his lungs or something went bad on him, and he went broke and the doctor said he had to beat it out of here to a more salubrious climate. Some nut filled his ear about gold hunting up in Alaska, and he fell for it. He chewed it over with his wife, and she was for it, too, cause the doctor had told her her old man would bump off if he stuck around here, and they hadn't any money to get away together. She figured she could get along working out by day till he came back a millionaire, and old Daney started off. I don't know how he got there. I'm just fillin' in what I hears French Pete and Marnie talkin' about. I guess mostly he beat his way there ridin' the rods. Anyway, he got there. See? And then he goes down sick there again, and a hospital or some outfit has to take care of him for a couple of years, and back here the old woman's got kind of feeble and on her uppers, and there was hell to pay, and— What's bitin' your nose, Nan? The pug's lisping whisper broke sharply in upon Pinky Bond's story. Rhoda Gray started. She was conscious now that she had been leaning forward, staring in a startled way at Pinky as he talked, conscious now that for a moment she had forgotten that she was Gypsy Nan. But she was mistress of herself on the instant, and she scowled blackly at the pug. "'Maybe it's me soft heart that's touched,' she flung out acidly. "'Use close your trap and let Pinky talk.' "'Yes, shut up,' said Pinky. "'What was I saying? Oh, yes. And the old guy makes a strike. Can you beat it?' 
I don't know nothing about the way they pull them things, but he's off by his lonesome, out somewhere, and he finds gold, and he stakes out his claim. But he takes sick again, and he can't work it, and it's all he can do to get back alive to civilization. He keeps his mouth shut for a while, figuring he'll get strong again. But it ain't no good, and he gets a letter from the old woman telling how bad she is, and then he shows some of the stuff he found. After that there's nothing to it. Everybody's beaten it for the place. But at that, old Danny comes out all right, and goes crazy with joy, cause some guy offers him twenty-five thousand bucks for his claim, and throws in the expenses home for good luck. He gets the money in cash, twenty-five one-thousand-dollar bills, and the chicken feed for expenses, and starts back here to the old woman. But this time he don't keep his mouth shut about it, when he'd have been better off if he had. See? He was telling about it on the train. I guess he was telling about it all the ways across. But anyway, he tells about it come from Philly this afternoon, and French Pete and Marnie Day happens to be on the train, and they hears it, and frames up to annex the coin before morning, cause he's got in too late to get the money into any bank today. Pinky Bond paused, and stuck his finger significantly in his cheek. Skulker was rubbing his hands together now in a sort of unctuous way. It sounds pretty good, he murmured, only there's Dangler. You sleep Dangler to me, broke in the pug. As soon as we hands one of dem two boobs and gets the cash, Pinky can beat it back here with the coin, and wait for me while I finds Dangler and squares it with him. He ain't going to put up a holler at dat. We ain't running de gang into nothing. Dis here is private business, see? So you just take a sneak with yourself, and fix a nice alibi for us so's we won't be taking any chances. Schlucker frowned. But what's the good of that, he demurred. French Pete and Marnie Dale see you anyway. Will they? scoffed the pug. Guess once more. A couple of handkerchiefs over our mugs is good enough for dem, if yous holds your end up. And they wouldn't talk for publication anyway, would they? Schlucker smiled now almost ingratiatingly. And how much is my end worth? he inquired softly. One of dem thousand-dollar engravings, stated Pug promptly and Pinky'll run around and slip it to you as before morning. All right, said Schlucker, after a moment. It's half-past eight now. From nine o'clock on, you can beat any jury in New York to it that you were both at the same old place, as long as you keep decently under cover. That'll do it, won't it? I'll fix it. But I don't see— Rhoda Gray, as Gypsy Nan for the first time, projected herself into the discussion. She cackled suddenly in jeering mirth. I thought something was wrong with her, whispered the pug with mock anxiety. Maybe she ain't well. Tell us about it, Nan. When I do, she said complacently, maybe you'll smile out of the utter corner of that mouth of yours. She turned to Schlucker. You needn't lay awake waiting for that thousand, Schlucker, cause you'll never see it. The little game's all off, cause it's already been pulled, see? There was a near riot as I passed along the street going to your place, and I gets piped off at what's up, and it's the same story that Pinky told, and the crib's cracked, and the money's gone, that's all. Schlucker's face fell. I said you were fools when I first came here, he burst out suddenly, wheeling on Pinky Bon and the pug. I'm sure of it now. I was wondering a minute ago how you were going to keep your lamps on Pete and Marnie from here, or know when they were going to pull their stunt, or where to find them. Pinky Bon, ignoring Schlucker, leaned toward Rhoda Gray. "'Say, Nan, is that straight?' he inquired anxiously. "'You sure?' "'Sure, I'm sure,' Rhoda Gray asserted tersely. The one thought in her head now was that her information would naturally deprive these men here of any further interest in the matter, and that she would get away as quickly as possible, and in some way or another see that the police were tipped off to the fact that it was French Pete and Marnie Day that had taken the old couple's money. Those two old faces rose before her again, blotting out most curiously the face of Pinky Bond just in front of her. She felt strangely glad, glad that she had heard all of old Danny's story, because she could see now an ending to it other than the miserable, hopeless one of despair that she had read in the Danny's faces just a little while ago. "'Sure, I'm sure,' she repeated with finality. "'How long ago was it?' prodded Pinky. "'I don't know,' she answered. I just went to Schlucker's, and then we comes over here. Yous can figure it out for yourself. And then Rhoda Gray stared at the other, with sudden misgiving. Pinky Bond's face was suddenly wreathed in smiles. I'll answer you now, Schluck, he grinned. What do you think? 
that we're nuts, me and Pug? Well, forget it. We didn't have to stick around watching Pete and Marnie. We just had to wait until they had collected the dough. That was the most trouble we had, wondering when that would be. Well, we don't have to wonder any more. We know that the cherries are ripe, see? And now we'll go and pick em. Where? Where do you suppose? Down at Charlie's, of course. I hears em talking about that, too. They ain't so foolish. They're out for an alibi themselves. Get the idea? They was to sneak out of Charlie's without anybody seeing em, and if everything broke right for em, they was to sneak back again and spend the night there. They ain't so foolish. I guess they ain't. There ain't no place in New York you can get in and out of without nobody knowing it like Charlie's, if you know the way, and— Ah, write it down in your memoirs, interposed the pug impatiently, and moved to the door. It's all right, Schlucker, all the way. Now everybody beat it and get on the job. Nan, you sticks with Pinky and me. Rhoda Gray, her mind in confusion, found herself being crowded hurriedly through the doorway by the three men. Still in a mentally confused condition, she found herself a few minutes later, Schlucker having parted company with them, walking along the street between Pinky Bon and the pug. She was fighting desperately to obtain a rip upon herself. The information she had volunteered had had an effect diametrically opposed to that which she had intended. She seemed terribly impotent, as though she were being swept from her feet and borne onward by some swift and remorseless current whether she would or no. The pug, in his curious whisper, was talking to her. Pinky nosed a way in. We don't want any row in there on account of Charlie. We ain't for putting his place on de rough and getting him raided by de bulls. Charlie's all to de good. See? Well, that's what'd likely happen if me and Pinky busts in on Pete and Marnie without sending in our visitin' cards first, polite-like. They would pull their guns, and though we'd get the coin just the same, there'd be hell to pay for Charlie, and the whole place would go up in fireworks right off the bat. Well, this is where yous come in. Yous are the visitin' card. Yous gets in their bunk room, pretendin' yous have made a mistake, and yous leave the door open behind yous. They don't know yous, and bein' a woman, they won't pull no gun on yous. And then yous breaks it gently to em that there's a couple of gents outside, and just about then they looks up and sees me and Pinky and our guns, and I guess that's all. Get it? Sure, Rhoda Gray mumbled. The pug talked on. She did not hear him. It seemed as though her brain ached literally with an acute physical pain. What was she to do? What could she do? She must do something. There must be some way for her to save herself from being drawn into the very center of this vortex, toward which she was being swept closer with every second that passed. The two old faces, haggard in their despair and misery, rose before her again. She felt her heart sink. She had counted, only a few minutes before, on getting their money back for them, through the police. The police! How could she get any word to the police now, without first getting away from these two men? And suppose she did get away, and found some means of communicating with the authorities? It would be Pinky Bon here, and the pug who would fall into the meshes of the law quite as much as French Pete and Marnie Day, and to have Pinky and the pug apprehended now, just as they seemed to be opening up the gateway for her to the inner secrets of the gang, meant ruin to her own hopes and plans. And to refuse to go with them now, as one of them, would certainly excite their suspicions and suspicion of Gypsy Nan was the end of everything for her. Her hands, under her shawl, clenched until her nails bit into her palms. She couldn't do anything. And there was the money, too, for those two old people. Wasn't there any? She caught her breath. Yes, yes. Perhaps there was a way to save the money. Yes, and at the same time to place herself on a firmer footing of intimacy with these two men here, if she went on with this. But— she shook her head. She could afford no buts now. They must take care of themselves afterwards. She would play Gypsy Nan now without reservation. These two men here, like Schlucker, were obviously ignorant that Gypsy Nan was Dangler's wife. So she was. Pinky Bond's hand was on her arm. She had stumbled. Look out for yourself, he cautioned under his breath. Don't make a sound. They had drawn into a very dark and narrow way between two buildings, and now Pinky kept his touch upon her as he led the way along. 
what was this charlie's she did not know except that from what had been said it was a drug dive of some kind patronized extensively by the denizens of the underworld she did not know where she was now save that she had suddenly left one of the out-of-the-way east side streets pinky halted suddenly and bending down lifted up what was evidently a half section of the folding trap door to a cellar entrance there's only a few of us regulars wise to this whispered pinky watch yourself there's five steps count em so's you won't trip keep hold of me all the way and nix on the noise or we won't get away with it inside leave the trap open pug for our getaway we ain't going to be long come on it was horribly dark rhoda gray with her hand on pinky bond's shoulder descended the five steps she felt the pug keeping touch behind by holding the corner of her shawl they went forward softly slowly stealthily she felt her knees shake a little and suddenly panic seized her and she wanted to scream out what was she doing where was she going was she mad that she had ventured into this trap of blackness blackness it was hideously black she looked behind her she could not see the pug close as he was to her and dark as she had thought it outside there at the cellar entrance it appeared by contrast to have been light for she could even distinguish now the opening through which they had come they were in a cellar that was damp underfoot and the soft earth deadened the sound as they walked upon it and they seemed to be walking interminably it was too far much too far she felt her nerve failing her she looked behind her again that opening still discernible to her straining eyes beckoned her lured her better to pinky halted again she bumped into him and then she felt his lips press against her ear here they are he breathed they got the end room on the right so's they could get in and out without being seen and so's even charlie'd swear they was here all the time you're too old a bird to fall down nan if the door's locked knock and give em any old kind of song and dance till you gets em off their guard the pug and me'll see you through go it before rhoda gray could reply pinky had stepped suddenly to one side a door in front of her a sliding door it seemed to be opened noiselessly and she could see a faintly lighted narrow and very short passage ahead of her it appeared to make a right angle turn just a few yards in and what light there was seemed to filter in from around the corner and on each side of the passage before it made the turn there was a door and from the one on the right through a cracked panel a tiny thread of light seeped out her lips moved silently after all it was not so perilous nobody would be hurt pinky and the pug would cover those two men in there and take the money and run for it and the pug gave her an encouraging push from behind she moved forward mechanically there were many sounds now but they came muffled and indeterminate from around the corner ahead all save a low murmuring of voices from the door with the cracked panel on the right it was only a few feet away she found herself crouched before the door but she did not knock upon it instead her blood seemed suddenly to run cold in her veins and she beckoned frantically to her two companions she could see through the crack in the panel there were two men in there French Pete and Marnie Day, undoubtedly, and they sat on opposite sides of a table, and a lamp burned on the table, and one of the men was counting out a sheaf of crisp, yellow-backed banknotes. But the other, while apparently engrossed in the first man's occupation, and while he leaned forward in apparent eagerness, was edging one hand stealthily toward the lamp, and his other hand, hidden from his companion's view by the table, was just drawing a revolver from his pocket. There was no mistaking the man's murderous intentions. A dull horror that numbed her brain seized upon Rhoda Gray. The low-type, brutal faces under the rays of the lamp seemed to assume the aspect of two monstrous gargoyles, and to spin around and around before her vision. And then it could only have been but a fraction of a second since she had begun to beckon to Pinky and the pug. She felt herself pulled unceremoniously away from the door, and the pug leaned forward in her place, his eye to the crack in the panel. She heard a low, quick-muttered exclamation from the pug, and then suddenly, as the lamp was obviously extinguished, the crack of light in the panel had vanished. But in an instant, curiously like a jagged lightning flash, light showed through the crack again, and vanished again. It was the flash of a revolver shot from within, and the roar of the report came like a roll of thunder on its heels. 
Rhoda Gray was back against the opposite wall. She saw the pug fling himself against the door. It was a flimsy affair. It crashed inward. Shoot your flash on the table and grab the coin. I'll fix the other guy. Were eternities passing? Her eyes were fascinated by the interior beyond the broken wall. It was utterly dark inside there, save the ray of a flashlight played now on the table, and a hand reached out and snatched up the scattered sheaf of banknotes. And on the outer edge of the ray two shadowed forms struggled, and one went down. Then the flashlight went out. She heard Pug speak. Beat it! Commotion came now, cries and footsteps from around the corner in the passage. The pug grasped her by the shoulders and rushed her back into the cellar. She was conscious, it seemed, only in a dazed and mechanical way. There were men in the passage running toward them, and then the passage had disappeared. Pinky Bon had shut the connecting door. "'Hop it like blazes,' whispered the pug, as they ran for the faint glimmer of light that located the cellar exit. "'Separate the minute we're outside,' he ordered. "'There's murder in there. Pete shot Marnie.' I put Pete to sleep with a punch on the jaw, but the bunch knows there was someone else there, and Pete'll swear it was us, though he don't know who we was that did the shootin'. I gotta make this straight right off the bat with Dangler. His whispering voice was labored, panting. They were climbing up the steps now. Youse take the money to my room, Pinky, and wait for me. I won't be much more'n half an hour. Nan, youse beat it for your garret and stay there. They were outside. The pug had disappeared in the darkness. Pinky was closing and evidently fastening the trap door. The other way, Nan, he flung out as she started to run. That takes you to the other street, and they can't get around that way without going around the whole block. Me for a fence I knows about, and we gives em a merry laugh. Go on. She ran, ran breathlessly, stumbling, half falling, her hands stretched out before her to serve almost in lieu of her eyes for she could make out scarcely anything in front of her. She emerged upon a street. It seemed abnormal. The quiet, the lack of commotion, the laughter, the unconcerned voices of the passers-by among whom she suddenly found herself. She hurried from the neighborhood. End of chapter 12